A few weeks ago, CVP sent us a DJI Ronin 2 gimbal. Now, it was a prototype, but the marketing material promised a lot. So we decided to take it out, give it a good kicking, and see what it could do. And the results really surprised us. And now they've now sent us an updated version. It's very close to production ready. So we thought we'd make this video to share our experiences with you. With filming equipment, you want it to be strong and reliable, quick to set up and easy to use. And those are certainly none of the adjectives I usually use to describe any of the gimbals I've used in the past. Anyhow, enough chat. Let's see what the Ronin 2 is all about. The first thing to strike me about the Ronin 2 has been its size. She really is a whopper. And you need to recalibrate your perspective on gimbals, particularly if you're used to using smaller setups. It's been designed to take camera builds up to 15 kilograms. That's about 30 pounds. And to give you some scale on things, this red here weighs about five kilograms. This Alexa Mini setup, that's about six. And this big Amira setup, that's only just over eight kilograms. So that's half, or just over half the capacity that the Ronin 2 can handle. One of the headline items for the Ronin 2 is its power, and you can see from the size of the pan motor just how big it is. DJI claim an accuracy of 0.02 degrees and that it's eight times more powerful than the original Ronin. But what does that really mean? What it means is all that power, it can resist external forces. So that's gonna deliver you great whip pans and it's also gonna fight against G-force and external factors such as wind. So that means if you're in a tracking vehicle, you can travel up to 75 miles an hour, which is about 120 kilometers an hour, and still have stable footage. The Ronin 2 feels nice and durable, and it has been weatherproofed, which means in drizzle, light rain, a bit of snow, it shouldn't cause you any problems. Personally, we would cover up any exposed ports on it, but it's probably good to keep going till the water starts hitting the lens and you have to stop anyway. On top of the pan motor is a quick release wedge. It's been designed so you can quickly remove it from the ring and put it onto other equipment such as a cable cam, a drone, a tracking vehicle, a steady cam. It's a nice simple design. It's got a wedge, two holes for safety pins and a lock. All you have to do is simply slide it in, wait for the click and then just lock it off. That simple. And to remove it, undo the lock, press the button, and off it comes. Because of its carrying capacity, the Ronin 2 needs some serious room inside it to mount the larger cameras. Hidden inside the arms here are extensions, which allow well over 50 mil of travel. It's one of the few things you actually need a tool for to access. Once you've extended it, as you can see, you've got markings down the side here, so you know exactly where you're at. Tighten up the bolts, and you're good to go. One of my favorite features on the Ronin 2 are the locks you can find on each axis. There's one just here for tilt, one on the back here for roll, and a final one on the side of the pan motor for pan. Now, if you're looking to mount the Ronin 2 on top of a Steadicam, then locking the pan axis can be done by itself with the system in full operation. It makes it really easy to transport cameras around. It means nothing's gonna move. But more importantly for me is during the setup process. Balancing big cameras can sometimes be a little bit of a pain. And the ability to lock all the axis and then release one means you can focus only on one axis and get that sorted and then move on to the next one. Balancing big cameras on gimbals in the past had some challenges. And usually this is around those final adjustments right at the end of the balancing process. You've got everything mounted, everything's in place. You just maybe want to slide it back a little bit. And as you've unlocked it and you're just pushing it back, the whole lot slips and you have to start again, essentially. The beautiful thing about the Ronin 2 is it's got a number of fine adjusters dotted about. This means you can make minute adjustments on different axis 
and get everything set up just right without the risk of everything slipping away. So down the bottom here with the locks off, I can move the main plate back and forward or left and right. I can move the cage up and down or on the top here, I can move the whole lot back and forth. And it's particularly useful when you're mid-shoot and you need to make an adjustment. Maybe you've thrown a filter in or you've made some changes somewhere. You just need to make a quick minute adjustment. Another useful feature are the feet that are integrated into the ring, which allow the whole setup to freestand by itself. We found ourselves using the ring quite a lot just as a place to hold the gimbal whilst we were making some changes maybe to a vehicle mount or to transport it between different locations. The Ronin 2 comes with a heavy-duty flight case with wheels and custom foam. It does have to be dismantled to go in, but it's so quick to set up that it's not an issue. In fact, we were surprised just how small you can break it down. The kit here with five batteries weighs about 27 kilograms, so you can easily get it on a plane. The Ronin 2 comes with a whole host of accessories. We haven't got them all here today, unfortunately, but if you go onto the DJI website, you can see the really extensive list. Some of the items you get are for mounting the camera, such as the dovetail plate, and this is the top cross plate. I particularly like this because it's designed to go straight onto an Alexa Mini. You recognize the mounting holes. It even comes with the correct bolts required, and they're captive bolts, so they won't fall out if you shake it around. It also fits perfectly onto a red as well, and it's designed so you can mount it on a whole variety of different cameras. You get a block in case you want to replace the top handle with standard threadings on there. You also get a universal mount. I'm sure there's some delightful cutaway showing it to you right now. Power-wise, you get two TB50 batteries, and they're designed to sit in the battery mount. You get one each side. One of my favorite items is this charging hub. I don't know why I find it so delightful and pleasing, but you can charge four batteries at a time. You get a remote control, and this is probably one of the bits that excites me most. It's a breakout box for power and for camera control. The block sits on the bottom crossbar of the Ronin 2, so you'll probably install it when you first get things set up, but I imagine you won't take it off unless there's some upgrade. It's got a number of power outputs, but these also CAN bus ports, so they carry data, which is going to be interesting to see what expansion there is in the future. And it's also an interface for the cameras. DJI will supply you with power and control cables for the ARRI and the RED, as well as two pin DC and PTAP power cables. Four. With the exception of this big chunky cable on the front, all the other wiring on the Ronin 2 is integrated, which makes for a very sleek design and saves a lot of snagging of cabling. It has numerous power points connected all over it. There's a whole host of 14 volt, 12 volt, and PTAP connectors. We've got three down here, another one over this side, a couple up the front here, and on the back of the battery unit are two PTAP connectors. Speaking of the battery unit, as I said before, it takes two TB50 batteries. These are the same batteries from the Inspire 2. They're 4,280 milliamps, and they're 6S LiPos, which means there's just over 97 watt-hours of energy inside them. They're dead simple to use. They just slide in each side. And by having two of them, it means you can hot swap. And because the powers run off the same set of batteries, by hot swapping, you never have a power outage. Of course, on the side of these as well is also a battery checker so we can see how much power is left inside them. And this whole lot simply sticks on the back here. And you can leave the battery holder on there the whole time. Uh, we've been finding we've been taking it on and off, we've been mounting it to a vehicle, um, but once it's on there, it tends to stay on there. The other alternative is you can pull it off, plug in an extension cable, and run the batteries remotely. As well as integrated power, we also have an SDI port here and one up the top here, which means an integrated HD SDI signal. 
so everything can keep spinning away and you've got a permanent point of contact up the top here. This is incredibly useful. One magic trick the batteries have up their sleeve is they have heaters built into them, which means they can self-heat and self-regulate, which means there's no power loss down to temperatures as low as minus 20. DJI states a runtime of eight hours for the gimbal only, but because you can run the camera, the follow focus motors, wireless video, all your other accessories off these two batteries, which makes things nice and simple, you're not gonna get anywhere near that runtime, but it is incredibly efficient. Last night we shot for five hours. The gimbal was in heavy use and we ran quite a lot. Using the red setup you saw earlier, we got through about four batteries. There was a tiny bit left in them. I think for a day shoot, if you weren't recharging, six would probably be okay. If we were building a package, we'd probably have eight of them to hand. Obviously you can recharge the batteries nice and easily. They slip off, obviously they're hot swappable, and they go into the charging unit. Let's click in. The charging unit takes four batteries and it charges two batteries at a time. It will decide which two batteries have got the most amount of power left and start charging those first, which means you'll be up and running sooner. From a flat battery to full, it takes 90 minutes to a complete charge. So 90 minutes per two batteries. The Ronin 2 can of course be operated by remote and it comes with its own compact remote control which apparently has a range of 1.6 kilometers, working on both 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz. If you'd rather use your existing remote, then on the back of the Ronin, there is a D-Plus port behind this flap. And supplied with it is a D-Bus to S-Bus cable, so you can plug in your traditional receiver, such as this one from Futaba. Of course, working on an S-Bus based system means that you could use something much more traditional like Alpha Wheels to give you control of the gimbal remotely. As you'd expect, it has GPS built in, which helps when you're doing maneuvers with high G-forces. And the system is fully compatible with DJI's A3 flight control system. I thought it was worth taking a couple of minutes to show you how I would install and balance the camera on a gimbal. I say gimbal rather than Ronin 2 because really this approach is pretty much identical to whichever gimbal you use. Everyone's got their own way of doing things in their own order, but hopefully showing you how I do it on this one will show you how much easier it is than often a lot of the time. So the first thing I tend to do is find out where the center is down the bottom Where's the balance point really? So I just use my hand as a pivot and I get a rough idea that it's somewhere around about here. I've taken the top bar off and a few grunts and she's slid into place and lock the dovetail plate in place. Then release the tilt axis. Okay, so I'm a little bit front heavy here, but that's okay. So now, releasing the lock underneath, I can now use the little dials, oh, there we go, to slide it back and forth. I find it easier to take this off to begin with. Okay, so we've done the tilt axis. The next thing I wanna do is the vertical axis here. So here at the moment, we've balanced front to back. Now we want to get top to bottom. So what I want to try and do is get the lens pointing, or get the camera as vertical as possible. And I'm seeing which way it's going. So if I let go of it now, it wants to roll forwards. That means on this axis, I need to move the whole lot up. So I undo the locks either side. The beautiful thing about this is we've got a nice scale so I can make sure I'm doing each side evenly. So I want to move it up. So I'm just going to use the adjusters at the bottom here. There we go, perfect. And checking the scale on each side, I can see whether we've got even balance. And if I leave it there, it's quite happy to sit there. So I'll put the locks back on. Quickly going to nip back to the tilt. So I'm just going to back off this lock again. And I'm going to throw the whole rig forwards a little bit. We're looking pretty good. Okay, 
The next thing I'm going to do is then release the roll lock at the back. And we can see straight away it wants to slide across towards me. So again, with the lock released underneath, I can begin moving the camera left and right. A little bit more, a bit too far. We're looking pretty good. One of the other tricks we use is particularly with the zoom lens. As you zoom forward and back or as you focus, you're shifting the glass in the lens forward and back. So that's throwing the balance off. So we tend to put the zoom and the focus at a midpoint, um, trying to get the best of all worlds. And the last one we've got to worry about is our pan. Now the way to do pan is get it, if you tilt the camera along this axis, we can see where it wants to go. And at the moment it wants the lens to swing back towards me. So that's telling me that I've got too much weight this side of the axis. So I want to shift the whole lot back, make sure that's unlocked. And I'm going to start moving this mass back. And soon it'll want to swing the other way. So the lens will come towards the camera. There we go. Now it doesn't want to move anywhere. So there we go. We now have a balance rig. Four. So it's a new day, new location, new t-shirt, and our camera build is ready to go. So it's time to power up. The first thing I'm gonna do is make sure I unlock each of the axis locks. Oh, around this side. So it's nice and free to move. And you've got two choices of powering on. There's a power button at the front on the pan motor, or there's one here. Now, if you look at the screen on the back, when I turn it on, you'll see how quickly it really does boot. Here we go. On the back here, we've got a screen. It's super bright. It's a thousand nits, and certainly in bright daylight, we had no problem seeing it. So you can control all the settings from the touch screen, or you can use these physical buttons that are dotted about, or you can use the Assistant app. This button here is very important. If I press and hold this, it shuts down all the motors, which is really handy if you have got to change media on the car in the camera or change a setting. The other button here is a slide. If I slide that across, that disables all the buttons on the back here, so you can't accidentally knock something. The next thing we're going to go into is then the motors. And I'm not going to worry about anything in here apart from auto-tune down the bottom. So if I press auto-tune, it's going to ask me what percentage to do it to. If you set the percentage too high, everything's going to be too stiff and it's going to want to vibrate. If you set it too low, it's going to be a bit sloppy and it won't be reactive enough. We found that about 60-70% seems to be about right. So I'm going to press go. And as you can see, it's off and running. If I was doing this manually, I'd essentially power up each motor and increase the power to it to make it as strong as possible to the point where it wants to oscillate, you know, it wants to vibrate, and then I'd back it off again. And that's what it's doing here. So it's testing all the individual axis. It's sending vibrations through the system and it's backing things down. It's, it's sort of finding this balance point. On the back, you can see it's progress. It doesn't take very long at all. Uh, in a second, we'll see that bar go green. There we go and we're good to go. So if I come out of here, the final piece of the puzzle that I like to check is if I go down to monitor and hit select, I can see how much power is being consumed from each motor. So if I'm to push on the roll motor, you can see the spike on the graph and that tilt up, or on the tilt motor here, you can see. So what I like to see is in its resting state, in its neutral position with it powered on, how much motor power is being used, what percentage of the motor power is being used. And if I'm seeing a figure, for me personally, I say about four or less, then I know it's about right. Once I've done that, the next thing I like to do is pick it up and give it a good wobble around and to see, you know, is, is there any funny vibrations coming through. The supplied remote control is compact and really easy to use. Obviously, you've got the big joystick on it, which allows us to pan and tilt. The dials across the top allow us to set the speed of the motors. So if I want to dull pan right down, you can see that makes life a lot smoother. There's a spring-loaded dial here, which allows us to adjust the roll. 
There's a mode button which allows us to turn smooth track on and off and also recenter the camera. Obviously the power button, the status LED, this tells us if it's green it's connected, if it's red it's not connected. And on the back we can also see on the display how much signal strength there is. Obviously the battery LED and a trigger for the camera. There's also a profile button which isn't working in this beta version. Uh, but we're assuming you can have different setups, maybe a really quick reactive mode ready to go and maybe a really doled out mode um, for when you need things to be nice and smooth. On the sides, we've got two user assignable buttons. Under the flap, we've got the USB charging port for charging the internal battery, um, which we've been really impressed with. We've been using it all day today and it's barely gone down at all. On the other side, behind the flap is another bus port, probably for uh, I'm guessing future upgrades or other bits of kit linking into it. On the back, we've got a thread mount, a bar, which makes it nice and handy if you want to rest it down or pick it up. And on the base, a little loop to probably attach a lanyard to. You can also configure the Ronin 2 wirelessly through the DJI Assistant app, the new app they've developed. Across the top here, we have the status we can see it's in handheld mode, it's got smooth track turned on, the battery percentage and other bits and bobs. I'm going to take you through each of the menu items and give you a bit of a whistle stop tour of the, the key settings and variables that we've played around with. If we go into configuration, the first thing to do is go into motor parameters. You can see I can set my auto tune and its percentage and if I was to tap that it would get the auto tune going. And I can see my main set of data for the motor. And these are the items I'm really interested in. So the first setting is stiffness. If I wanted to change any of these, I just tap on them, use the slider or the plus and minus. So stiffness. Stiffness is how much power there is going into the motor. So I want my motors to be as powerful as possible. If they're too weak, then they're going to be all sloppy. But if I make them too powerful, they'll begin to vibrate and then that will turn into oscillations and the gimbal won't work very well. Of course, Autotune sorts all this out, but if you did want to tweak, this is the place to start. So this is our stiffness setting. Then go across to strength. Strength is how hard the motor works to hold its position. Again, you want it to be reasonably strong, but you don't want it to be too strong. A good judge of whether it's strong enough is if I was to pull on an axis and let go, does it return to its original position? If it returns back reasonably quickly and quite quickly, then that's a good thing. If it was to overshoot and wobble around, then the setting's too high. And if it didn't really react quickly enough, then it's too loose. It's, it's, it's not strong enough. So we've got our stiffness, our strength, and then the next two items, these are items you probably very rarely touch. First, you have the out filter. Now this is a filter which allows the sensors to ignore high frequency vibrations. So if we were getting high frequency vibrations we couldn't get rid of, and you'd, you'd notice those because they make a zzzz noise. If you hear these high frequencies and you can't figure out where they're coming from and you really just need to filter them out, then you can apply a filter and it will begin to block them out. Obviously the danger of filtering out vibrations is in some cases you're not really curing the source, you're just putting a band-aid over it. But nonetheless, you have got a filter and you can see that the Auto-Tune has applied uh, out filters already. The last item on here is control and that's another way of filtering out vibrations, but a different type of vibrations. These are angular vibrations or torsional vibrations. Now I'm no engineering expert, but my understanding of this is if you imagine this is a shaft going through here and there's a motor on one end, and as you can see we've got quite a lot of weight on here, as the motor spins, there might be a slight delay, a torsional effect on the shaft. So as this spins, this is slightly delayed behind it, so they're not quite in line, and then that can begin to vibrate. And to me, these are slightly lower frequency vibrations. To be honest, it's incredibly rare for us to play around with the filters. They tend to be set very well in the auto-tune, but it's handy to know how they work should you get into a problem. Across the top here, we have a few more items. Uh, the main ones in here we're worried about are pan trim and tilt trim. And if I was to tap on those and to move the slider, you can see it's trimming exactly where the pan axis is going to be. The next menu item to look at is smooth track. 
Smooth Track allows the gimbal operator to direct the gimbal using inputs by manually steering it. So if I was to pick the gimbal up and I want it to pan, I'm just steering with my hands here, or to tilt. You can see it's following my moves. Now, we've got three axes to worry about. The pan, the tilt, and the roll. Typically on smooth track, you leave roll alone. It keeps the horizon level. Usually you're only worried about panning and tilting. And in each of these, I've got three settings. The first is the speed. So this is how quickly, when I put an input in, how quickly does the motor actually pan? If I was to turn this setting right down to say eight, I pick it up and I pan, you can see the motor's really slow to react. But if I was to turn this right up to 90, see what happens? It's super quick to react. The next item here is dead band. Imagine you're walking along and you're gonna have maybe some wobble to your arms as you're walking. Dead band is the area in which the gimbal won't react to your input. So with a really high dead band, let's turn this right up to 85. You can see if I put an input in, not much is happening right now. I have to really turn it, oh! In fact, it's such a big dead band, I can't even get it to turn. But if I turn this back down again, Let's make it a really low figure. And I turn, you can see it's immediately turning. So it's how much dead area there is in the axis I'm working on before the gimbal will begin to react. The final setting is acceleration. Now to show this, I'm gonna turn the speed right back down again. Now if I turn acceleration right down, acceleration is once I put an input into the gimbal, how quickly is that axis is going to accelerate to get up to the speed I've defined. So if I turn it now, you can see it's a really sort of smooth, slow acceleration to get up to the speed I've set. A higher figure, you'll see it pretty much goes to the speed I've set instantly. To give you an idea on how powerful this system is, if I ramp up the acceleration and I ramp up the speed and I take our dead band right down, so what I'm saying is, as soon as I give an input, I want it to be really reactive. You can see, I mean, this is a big old lump, how strong this PAM motor is. I'm able to whip it right round, and it's working really well. One of the other nice options in here is push pan. If I turn that on, I'm actually able to manually set to where I want the pan motor to be. And you can see, if I go into the tilt menu, I've got exactly the same settings again. And in roll, as I said earlier, we tend to leave smooth track off because we always want the horizon level. The next item on the menu is for setting all the parameters of the supplied remote control. And you can see I've got a page for each of the axis, pan, tilt, and roll. If I look at the roll axis, the first settings I come to are maximum and minimum. These are for setting a limit to how far you want that axis to move. So in this case, roll has a maximum of 30 degrees roll allowed each way before it will stop. The next settings down are dead band, max speed, and smoothing. Just like you have with smooth track, dead band is about a null area at the beginning of your movement of your joystick. Let me explain that another way. If you're on a really bumpy road and you're worried about putting commands into your joystick because you're being bounced about all over the place, you want a lot of dead band in there. That means you can begin to move the joystick. You have to put a really positive input into the joystick before it will start to react. The next item is max speed, and this is how fast, if I was to put input in, how fast I'm able to make that motor move. The great thing with the remote is I can also adjust max speed using the dials here. So if I ramp up our pan axis, you can see I can really whip it around quite quickly. And the final item is smoothing. Once you've set your dead band and your max speed, Smoothing is all about smoothing out your inputs. It's a bit like the acceleration side of the smooth track. The next page along is for setting up an external S-Bus controller. Maybe you have a Futaba controller or Alpha Wheels. And within here, you can assign channels to different functions and set up the parameters around that. The next menu item is super useful. It's the monitor view. Now there's three items in here, log, graph, and status. Log isn't working for us at the moment because this is only a beta application. 
In status, I can see what's going on. You know, have I got remote control connected? Have I got GPS connection? And I can see lots of telemetry about the batteries that are on board. If I come back and go into graph, this is what I'm really interested in. And within graph, I can get a graphical representation of lots of different factors. Wherever the green tick is, is what the graph is representing. So if I turn it down to the motor angle, you'll see a graph for that. But what I'm really interested in is power. And power is how much power is going into those motors at that precise moment in time. If I grab hold of it and give the gimbal a bit of grief, you can see this wonderful colorful display of what's going on and the numbers moving up and down. This is particularly useful if you're getting a vibration because you can look at the graph, see very clearly where the vibration is coming from, which motor or motors it's coming from, and that allows you to resolve any problem very quickly. By swiping across, I can look at data from the IMU, the gyros, um, gravity effect, drift, uh, the attitude settings, and the GPS settings. To be honest, I rarely go into any of these. The one I'm really interested in is the motor power. The final item on the configuration menu is settings. And within here, we can set all the base settings for the Ronin 2. We can choose which mode it's in. Is it gonna be on a car mount, handheld, on an aircraft, or on a tripod? We can select its movement mode. Do we want smooth track on or off? We can put it into FPV mode. On FPV mode, it will follow the input you put into it on every axis. Don't think of it as smooth track. Smooth track smooths everything out, makes it nice and smooth. FPV will just follow you. If you were to roll the gimbal, it would roll with you. Tilt, pan. Sensor mode is almost the same, but it ignores roll inputs and tilt inputs. It just follows the pan axis. Coming out of here, we've got the motor kill option, which we, if we were to press that, all the motors would go dead and the same button on the back does the same. And we can choose which axis mode it's in. You've got three axis mode where all the axis are active. You've got pan lock mode. Pan lock might be useful if you're using a steady cam and you don't want the pan motor to do anything. You've got roll 360 mode, which allows the roll axis to roll a complete 360. Now it won't keep spinning to forever. There is a stop and there's gonna be some beautiful cutaway right now of the camera spinning around, um, but it will allow a complete roll 360. And you've got briefcase mode which is exactly the same as the previous Ronin. There's also a balance test, calibration settings. We can set where we want the battery warnings to be. And we can also restore the default settings. Next up on the main menu is the create mode. We've seen in all the marketing material that there are some uh, special modes designed in the Ronin 2. There's a panorama mode, which will allow you to point maybe a stills camera at very precise positions and stitch all the photos together afterwards to give you a high megapixel uh, panorama photo. There's a time-lapse mode for doing time lapses and a cam anchor mode, which I believe is a, a sort of motion tracking mode. I must admit, we haven't got all the features working here. We have got quite a handy remote control that we can control the gimbal with and we can set in there our speed, our roll and also trigger the camera. We do have a tracking mode where you can put in waypoints, decide where you want your camera to point and then put in delays and play the move back multiple times. Quite nifty, really handy if you wanted to do the same move over and over and over again. Back on the main menu, the last item we've got to look at is the about menu. Now this shows us about the account, obviously I'm logged in here, uh, the device we've got access to, and it tells us all the details about the firmware. Again, probably a menu you wouldn't be dipping in and out of very often. So far we've been able to use the Ronin 2 in two configurations, handheld use and on vehicles. We've only really stuck big rigs on it, big builds, because we really wanted to see what it was capable of. I'm sure if you're using smaller bills with prime lenses, then life would become only easier. But we thought if we give it a real stress and put something this size on it, then we'll really see what it's made of. The earlier version we had access to was a proper prototype. There was no GPS antenna and there was no remote control. But we focused all our time with that one on handheld use. So 
we found a really demanding environment and we gave it some real abuse. Have a look at the following video and you'll see how we got on. The results are pretty impressive. We had it powered on for the four hours we were shooting. We kept swapping the batteries with the hot swap, so at no point do we have to shut anything down. And it just kept performing all day. You can see we gave it some real abuse. We were obviously only using smooth track from the back of a truck off-road. It really surprising. And we were shooting up to 120 millimeters with it. So yeah, really impressed with how it got on. One of the other features we like with shooting with the ring is that you can remove the lower half of it, which makes it a lot easier to get down nice and low and skim the camera across the floor. In vehicle mount, it also performed really well. The things we like about it for vehicle mounting is it's dead easy to take on and off. It's not particularly fussy. It's easy to transport in the ring. The remote control works really well. And we were doing speeds of up to 70 miles an hour without any problem with it. A really impressive piece of kit. Two. Now I don't want to sound too much like a fanboy, but we've actually spent more time resolving issues with the cameras than we have with the gimbal. It's kind of faded into the background a little bit, which is really rare having that kind of experience on a shoot with a gimbal. It's been quick to set up, it's been easy to use, it feels really solid, and it's been really reliable, exactly how you want a piece of kit to behave. Features we really love about it are the fine tuning knobs, which makes setup very easy, the integrated cabling with the power distributed everywhere, and the SDI signal coming up through. And one of the things we love most about it is not just the strength of its motors, but its capacity to handle larger builds, particularly builds where you want to do live zooms, so you're shifting big chunks of glass back and forth, and we haven't seen that affect us at all, really. It really has performed incredibly well. There's only a couple of changes we'd like to see to the Ronin 2. The first being when you tighten up this knob after making minor adjustments, it does shift the weight of the camera just a shade. Um, it's something you can compensate for and you get used to, but it would be great if you didn't have to. The other thing is we have had a few vibrations from the battery mount, but we've been told by DJI that there's going to be a tightening mechanism on the battery box on the release version. So hopefully it's something we don't have to worry about. There's a couple of items we're hoping DJI have in the pipeline. We have no idea, but we would be excited to see a three motor fizz control system for the lenses. At the moment, their single access system works incredibly well, especially for the money. And with the CAN bus built into the power sockets, it all seems very logical and hopefully they're heading in that direction. In addition to a full fizz control system, it would be great to see a slightly more advanced remote with some other features on it. Live monitoring would be really cool and integration of three axis lens control. Yeah, that would be pretty exciting as well. So fingers crossed there's some more bits and bobs coming out. We think this is a great bit of kit. It's so nice to have something that's been well thought up and designed. Often with pieces of kit like this, you feel like you're on a bit of a journey with the manufacturer, like you're one of their beta testers, but this really does feel like a finished product. It's great to see DJI entering the cinema market and the fact that you can get such big builds in here. I think some of the smaller cameras might be a little bit lost inside it. There has been some chatter about the price point, but have a look at the specs and its capabilities and then compare them to other products. And I think you'll see how affordable it really is. We're here it's shipping shortly and we can't wait to get our hands on a production version. Let's use the traffic with a test one.